thank you everyone for joining us for tonight's meeting on, on Good, Clean, and Fair. This is the third of our lectures with the Anthropology Public Outreach Program and Slow Food Columbus, and we're really excited for you all to be here and to celebrate um, or stay with us. Um, just as a, a note, related to birthday to Seventh Son, they were our, uh, the site for our we were able to do this in person. Unfortunately, obviously, the circumstances have not allowed us to do that. Um, and so we're so incredibly um, grateful for what they had done for us. And we hope to be able to visit them really soon for our next lecture series or whenever the next event allows us to do that. Um, as you can see on the screen, um, we've got a, a special can to celebrate their, their birthday. And so we encourage you to take a look at that and, and try it out and let us know what you think of it. Again, today is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, and so we're really excited with the timing of this and being able to um, talk about fair food in this context of what does it mean for our climate, for our environment, and for the people that are eating this food. Some other messages. Um, if you haven't already taken a look at it, uh, Slow Food Live um, is a series of webinars. If you visit the website on the screen, um, there are already some recorded uh, videos that you're able to see, as well as one from um, Cynthia Walter, board member of the of the group and coach chair for the Slow Food U USA School Garden Network. Um, she's talking about sowing uh, cool weather seeds under a low tunnel, and you can take a look at um, her video segment there. Um, you'll notice that all of your microphones are muted. Um, we ask you to turn your video off um, as the presenters are giving their talks. This allows us to make sure that the person who's speaking uh, will be able to do that. I believe I've got controls for the mics right now, and so it should be fine. Um, we found that if you turn your video off, that does help with the is when we get into the Q&A, the microphones will be um, unmuted in such a way that you can unmute yourselves. Uh, feel free to use the chat function um, to ask us questions, and we'll try and get through as many as we can at the end of the talk, so you can, you're more than welcome to um, just shout your question um, in the meantime or at the end of the Q&A section. Um, if you can stick around at the end of the event, there's going to be a brief survey um, that we'll ask you to fill out. That'll just help us uh, analyze a bit of this presentation and prepare us for the next lecture series for the All right. And with that said, I'm going to unshare my screen and I'll unmute Kareem, um, who's going to be our first presenter tonight, assistant professor, an assistant professor in city and regional planning at the Milton School of Architecture at Ohio State. Hello, uh, everybody. It's uh, a pleasure uh, to be able to to be here and just uh, just share some of what I've learned uh, on this journey. I'm really appreciative of um, <clears throat> Mark Anthony and, and others. Um, I'll share my screen. Um, I, I guess today I, I just kind of wanted to get through maybe tr three major basic things, um, sort of my motivation for this work. I hope it connects with Earth Day and the slow food um, uh, theme. Um, so my motivation for the work, um, some projects that I've <clears throat> worked on that I hope um, is a manifestation of that motiv motivation. And then to the end, so, um, a brief sort of summary on what I've learned moving forward. Um, and again, I hope this is, um, edifying and, and relevant um, to our group here this evening. Um, I'm Kareem Usher, um, Assistant Professor in Senior Regional Planning. My area of focus is uh, urban food systems planning, um, food justice work, um, social justice, uh, a lot things along that line. Um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> Although I come to sort of food is my manifestation here is um, my major driving, driving force, my motivation is to reduce hum human suffering and food is sort of a portal through which I can um, maybe affect some of that. Um, a quote that um, has sort of guided me so far is um, by an ethicist, uh, Emmanuel Levinas, um, that sort of really caused me to uh, take an inventory of my um, of myself, right? Uh, in terms of, you know, I'm here in this consciousness, a brief period of time, what, what is it that I should do? And um, basically this call to action that uh, I should do something to sort of reduce 
uh, oppression or suffering. And so suffering, um, you know, comes in many different forms. Certainly it, it looks differently in different ways. It could be housing, it could be food. Um, it could be what looks like abundance, but um, maybe folks are still uh, unhealthy. And certainly from an urban planner's point of view, uh, we look at the historical sort of effects. This is um, sort of, you know, tenements in earlier um, uh, decades in the US, uh, um, sort of the uh, larger cities. Um, so I sort of selected four of, of the work that I've been doing, four examples, and um, maybe this can um, sort of edify, sort of flesh out what I've been talking here. So the first one is looking at food, uh, household food insecurity in Belize. Uh, so Belize is um, where I am from, where I grew up. And there's been a long journey towards this position here. Uh, and so some of what I've been blessed with is be able to maybe um, look at these food insecurity effects back home. And I um, selected um, three um, Maya villages or indigenous uh, people in the Mesoamerica area um, and uh, sort of look at the effects of climate change on the yield of maize or corn, which is the staple product of, uh, the staple food of the um, Maya uh, in, the, in uh, Central America. And so sort of what we did was to gather um, local uh, Maya uh, milperos or farmers. And this is a meeting we had in Santa Cruz village. And basically what we've been seeing um, is sort of a shorter growing season for corn due to climate change. The rainy season is much longer. The growing season is shorter, which means harvest and yield are less. Um, and so we brought uh, the three villages together to maybe discuss their experiences uh, in terms of corn growth and maybe they can even share seeds or share uh, information uh, with each other to help each other uh, during this time. But there are also other socio-cultural uh, uh, issues going on, right? So um, growing corn in the traditional way is very hard. It, you use a machete, you you, you cut the bush and and you plant uh, the seeds. Um, so it's hard work, and what we're finding also is uh, the younger generation tend to not want to be in farming much. And so, along with um, climate change issues, sociocultural issues, um, uh, we are at least what we're hearing is. Um, you know, how would people feed themselves now, right? So there's this real question uh, in terms of um, food and also how is the culture passed on, you know, if young people um, are, are less likely to farm. Um, my second uh, uh, example here is um, I'm also leading um, a cooperative effort in, in Linden neighborhood here in Columbus. Um, it's basically um, a coalition um, of uh, residents, uh, clergy, the university um, that, you know, given the, the historical disinvestment in Linden, a um, couple years ago, the, the last uh, sort of full grocery store left, um, we've sort of taken on a challenge to pursue building uh, or developing a worker owned food business that would sell to large anchor and university, large anchor institutions such as the hospitals. Um, if we can work with local farmers to maybe add values, light processing to a, a product um, that, that would fit well with what um, the local hospitals or, or Ohio State would like to purchase. And so that's one initiative that we're also working on. Um, the goal is to hire not just Linden residents, but um, previously incarcerated um, citizens. So as they return, we know that they're, they have a higher, uh, more difficulty in um, uh, you know, getting a job. And so we wanted to make this 
uh, as an opportunity for them. And uh, also to be able to pay a living wage. And uh, the workers would eventually over time begin to own shares in the business. So it's a, it's a co-op. Uh, we hope that this would st stimulate some of the economy in Linden, uh, along with, it coincides with, I guess, the city councils and the mayor's um, broader plan for that area as well. <clears throat> uh, another example here is uh, work in Mansfield, Ohio. So in this project, we're working from the opposite angle. We're working with local farmers to farm uh, to, to form a uh, food aggregator, again, that would um, be able to sell uh, their produce uh, to local restaurants. So in this case, um, where a lot of the, a lot of, uh, the economic power is leaving the area where uh, mostly uh, commodity crops are being grown, we're wondering if we can yeah, get some local farmers to grow uh, more uh, sort of, you know, greens and other foods like that and then be able to um, not only sell it but also um, uh, uh, create some sort of uh, teaching uh, curriculum right where they're able to uh, use uh, this work to uh, teach young people about gardening and farming and be able to feed themselves and so we've been able to set up a demonstration urban micro farm on uh, OSU's Mansfield campus. And we're working with uh, local uh, community agencies and local farmers uh, to uh, create this uh, educational program as well. Then lastly, um, one of the techniques that we've been using um, in terms of assessing food access and it is uh, what we call photo mapping. And so um, community residents are trained to use a, um, a GPS uh, cameras and they would take pictures of elements within their food environment that either supports or hinders them accessing healthy food. And so we did this over a series of, uh, a series of months. Um, the pictures were collected. Um, we discussed them with the, the residents who took the pictures. We mapped this. And then we had this uh, sort of big community meeting uh, with elected officials and other community leaders where we talked about the issues. Uh, we were able to have residents stand up and discuss the pictures that they took, right? Why they took these pictures? Uh, where did they take it? And, it, it really adds um, the narrative to the data. So um, it's not just, you know, any researcher can come up there and say, this is what's going on. But if you have the people who actually helped in creating the information, creating the data, it adds uh, another element to the information. And so with all that, I think what I've come away with is how do we think about food access? So I came up with sort of a reconceptualization of that. Um, on your right, where you have access connected to five, what I call dimensions. Accessibility, I'm sorry, acceptability, accessibility, accommodation, affordability, and availability. And so access, at least from my preliminary understanding, and I'm, you know, I'm not, I don't consider myself an expert at all, but um, it, there needs to be that acceptable relationship, whether it's cultural, uh, whether it's your relationship with your local corner store, um, or something like that, because it doesn't, it doesn't matter if um, the store is physically close to you, um, there's a relationship that goes into that as well. Um, likewise with accommodation, um, these are more, as I tried to picture them on the left with the columns, are perception components, right? So accessibility, affordability, and availability are more objective. Uh, we can sort of tangibly measure these, but what about the more emotive, 
or our perception components. And I think that all needs to go into what in, in how we this think about access. Temporality is, is the time component. And so access might look different, different times of the year, um, uh, different stages in, your, in, your, in our lives, right? So as a younger person and as you get older, um, food access looks different, whether it's your physical capability to access food or just a different type of food you would uh, prefer to eat. And, and so whenever we're thinking about food policies, um, I think uh, we should consider these three, what I call sort of pillars here, objectivity, perception, and temporality. And, and I think uh, that's sort of my uh, presentation and, um, and I'll, I'll take you know, questions after. Thank you. Great, thanks so much for um, that presentation, Kareem. I really like this idea of looking you know, at an international level um, and seeing these case studies at regional and local levels and look forward to us talking a bit more about this um, at the end. Um, so next up, we'll have JP Fritz, who's the owner of Lasting Impressions and Event Rentals. Um, he's also our Slow Food Columbus treasurer. Okay, hopefully everyone can see me. Um, my presentation today is uh, how you can live slow food. Um, my name is JP Fritz. I'm the owner of Lasting Impressions Event Rentals and I'd like to explain why I'm involved with slow food and what fair food means to me. Um, that starts with a review of my life and food. In my early years, I'm told by my mother that I would eat almost anything as a child. Like, like most kids, I began not like certain things as I got older but still tended to eat most things. Growing up, my mother made many of the things that were popular to, at the time, including many mystery casseroles. However, while my mother was a soft, self-taught cook, not even being able to boil water when she married my father, she was very open to new things. She learned to cook many of my father's favorites from when he was a child, mostly German recipes from my grandmother. She also made lots of delicious soups. I grew up in Delphus, Ohio, small community in, north, in Northwest Ohio. Our normal way of eating was much in the slow food way. We bought food from local farm stands, got dairy and egg, eggs from local farmers and bought food, I'm sorry, bought local meat from the butcher. I remember my parents splitting a side of beef, for example, with my grandparents. From my earliest years, I remembered my father had a relatively large garden. I also remember my mother and grandmother canning lots of tomatoes, but also peaches, catsup, green beans, and other things that we would have in excess. One of my favorite memories is picking raspberries for my grandmother's pies. She told me I ate more than half of what I picked. I remember drying wal black walnuts and even a little hunting in the winter. The long and the short of it is people in rural, uh, rural areas lived a slow food lifestyle. Moving on to my college years, my parents were very open to new types of food and mostly willingly pulled me along. We went on regular summer vacations and my parents put effort into experimenting with food. At the end of my sophomore year of college, I planned a trip to Europe. The year before, a group of high school students came to Delphus for three weeks and our family hosted one of the students who we, I became friends with. His family invited me to stay with them for a month. They lived just south of Paris and I determined to eat whatever they put in front of me. When in Rome, do as the Romans. I found that harsh red wines taste better after several and taste even better with cheese. I learned that I love stinky cheese and that I would have never tried this in Ohio. Mostly I learned a different way of eating where lunch could be hours long. I learned how to make a vinaigrette. To put it mildly, it changed my life. This was also a time where rural America was changing. My father still had a garden and my mother canned tomatoes, but many foods were beginning to change. Poultry, eggs, dairy, and meat were coming from in the industrial food complex. Unknown to me, we were getting less quality, but the price was right. More and more packaged food was being consumed, resulting in less quality 
and food that was not as good for you. After college, I began to cook for myself. I would cut recipes out of the newspaper and attempt to make things. I start, started collecting spices and herbs, most of which I was unfamiliar with to make these recipes. I was taken under the wing of Mike Wilson, the owner of McLaren's Wine Store, and began to go to wine tastings and really experiment with wine. I met Roger Gentile, who taught me about Italian wines. I began to go to the North Market regularly. I became friends with Mike from Curds and Way and learned about olives, and of course, experimenting with more cheese. I started to learn how much better chicken was from North Market poultry and lamb from Blues Creek's farms. The quality of these food items showed me how great food could be. As I got older, I bought a wine store called Vino's in the old French market. I met, met tons of people in the wine industry. I also met, I met Carl Leisinger, who became my partner when I first was involved with my current company, Lasting Impressions Event Rentals. I began to read about food with Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma opening my eyes. I began to spend more time at farmer's markets and searching for foods that were grown locally. This love of good food drew me to the slow food move movement. That takes me to where I am today. Today, the quality of food is important to me primarily because of taste. Food made without too much of man's involvement simply tastes better. I regularly buy from local farmers at farmer's markets. I cook at home most of the time. I frequent restaurants that buy from local farmers. I have a garden and especially grow most of our fresh herbs. Only in the last few years have I begun to understand all of the things slow food means. Today we are talking about fair and I will explain what that means to me and how I live it. Fair means many things. First, it means fair conditions. How are people who harvest the food treated? Some of the most well-known and talked about are coffee and chocolate. Fair trade coffee, for example, was created in the Netherlands in 1988. It was created to ensure growers received enough wages to turn a profit. It has evolved into not only guaranteed prices, but also standards of quality. While the current situation is not perfect, many entrepreneurs have put tremendous effort into finding the best coffee beans from various areas, paying top prices. The end result has been better tasting coffee. Chocolate is another food that has profited from fair trade rules, resulting in exciting examples from many areas of the world we now get to taste. Fair trade rules and the consideration for our workers are treated and paid as changed many foods and other things we can buy today, from things like fruits, sugars, honey, to even textiles, gold, and diamonds. In many cases, it has changed the particular industry involved. Second, it, secondly, it means fair prices for the producers. This is mostly done by our desire for quality. When someone decides to produce an airline, heirloom or heritage product, we may find that the quality is better. It may mean that the cost of raising this heirloom product is higher. It may also mean that the producer is doing things in a way to limit production. Wine is a great example of higher quality being created by lowering the quantity of grapes per acre. Older vines produce less, but tend to have more intense flavor. When things taste better, we tend to be ready to pay more for them. Buying from farmer's markets allows us to get food and vegetables at the peak of freshness and probably grown with less pesticides and other growth inhibiting methods. Eggs will be bright orange and have twice the flavor. Heritage pork tends to be prized for juiciness, flavor, tenderness, tends to be pink hued and heavily marbled. Honey from a local producer will not be pasteurized, will be thicker and taste more of a place, depending on what flowers the bees pollinate. As a group, Slow Food supports this type of producer by paying more, a little more, and enjoying a lot more flavor. Third, fair means accessible prices for consumers. While most of what I talk about above is about fair prices for the people selling their goods, there are ways for consumers to be part of slow food movement, even on a tight budget. First, buy seasonally. In August, you can buy awesome heirloom tomatoes at the farmer's market for very reasonable prices. So the same would go for peppers, melons, and corn. When the harvest is coming in hot and heavy, you can eat these wonderful things at the peak of ripeness and for a very reasonable price. 
The same can be said for other times of the year. Especially in Ohio, now is the time for asparagus, green, young greens, spring onions, fresh peas, and of course, rhubarb. In the winter, hearty vegetables such as root vegetables, cabbage, kale, greens, broccoli, and cauliflower. By eating seasonally, you can buy what is freshest and usually cheapest. There are other ways to eat awesome foods on a budget, but they take time. An example is gardening. Growing your own fruits and vegetables is not only rewarding, but really means you get things at the peak of ripeness. Even people living in an apartment can grow their own herbs, greens, and tomatoes using space-saving methods. Canned vegetables when there is a glut. Every year I see usually an older person buying a large quantity of bruised vegetables for canning. They also make a bulk buy near the end of when a market is closing and pay half or even less. Of course, when the work comes, the benefit is fresh flavors in the middle of winter and for dirt cheap prices. Foraging is another way to eat great food without spending a lot of money. It is not something I have personally done, but I regularly get morel mushrooms and ramps in the spring and know many other things that can just be picked up for free. Finally, I want to state that living slow food is an ideal. It is an ideal that hopes to improve the experience of food in our life. One of the ways I save on food is to go to an ethnic food market. While this certainly does not cover the local aspect of slow food, it does not I do not know if every product I purchase has been made in a slow food way. It does have the feel of slow food. I especially love the Mediterranean market on High Street, south of Clintonville. I buy olives for lower prices than anywhere. I buy olive oil from Greece, local honey from Yoder's, and my favorite Bulgarian feta cheese. Do I know that all these foods are made in accordance to slow food? I do not, but the flavor is there, and generally where the flavor is, slow food is there. Living the slow food way is a goal. Each of us has to determine how we live it. I can say that in the re end result, will be better tasting food. Thank you. Thank you, JP, for uh, for sharing your, your story and for being able to connect all of that to the slow food movement. Um, just some context where we're having uh, JP share that story as a, a culmination of um, all of these different talks that we've been having before we get to Talking about all of that in the Q&A, we'll have uh, um, Cynthia present on her work. Hello, everyone. Happy Earth Day. I'd like to dedicate this presentation to my students and my own children. This is such a hard time for you, and I love you all. All right, let's get started. We are here for different reasons. It is important to address the joys and the sorrows, the passion and the anger during what has turned out to be a very long 15-year journey. In my lifetime, I hope to witness both the national school breakfast and lunch programs evolve into an equitable food system for all humans. My context is somewhat limited. I teach in an affluent school district, although I started my career teaching about 22 years ago with Columbus City Schools. I have experienced near poverty, poverty situations, but overcame these obstacles with the opportunities afforded to a white person. And I have poured my heart and soul into empowering students to stand up for their right to be well nourished through my school garden work. So what's on your plate? What are your food experiences and what lens do you look through? As I'm talking, Think about what type of meal you desire, what it looks like, and where did the food come from? Use the USDA meal, meal components to start the process of understanding the complexities of the National School Lunch Program. Think about how a child's mind works when presented with good and bad choices, whether their preferences leans toward sugar or salt or both. How likely are they to try new foods? And consider the environment where they sit to eat and the food culture that has been established in the lunchroom. How much does this mirror society? Now draw your image of good, clean, and fair a meal and be ready to compare it to what kids actually eat at school. 
Now, this is where things get complicated, or perhaps the complexities are by design. So we look in the other direction or we walk away because it's too difficult to confront. As parents, grandparents, teachers, we cannot imagine anyone intentionally wanting to harm our children or students with foods that make them sick. Walk through the lunchroom with me, as I have done many hours of lunch duty. Keep in mind, not all schools look the same, have the same equipment, or have the equal number of staff working. Many schools don't even have a kitchen, but simply a warming unit for prepared meals to be heated and transported from a central kitchen. There are two separate lines, the reimbursable meal line and the a la carte line. Paid students can roam freely between the reimbursable line and the a la carte line, as long as they have money in their account and cash in their pockets. If a family who lives at or below the poverty line, and if, the, and, if and when the application is filled out and accepted, the student gets the reimbursable meal at a reduced cost or free. The federal government reimburses the district a set amount for each paid, reduced, and free. The reimbursement only applies if a student takes three out of the five components with one having to be a fruit or vegetable. Unfortunately, an unintentional near reduced category is created when a family is near the poverty line and does not qualify for a free or a reduced meal. So the student is charged full price. Often these families cannot make consistent payments on their lunch accounts. If a student has a negative balance in their lunch account at no fault of their own, they are given a peanut butter sandwich and milk or denied a lunch altogether. Recent news stories and legislation has identified this as lunch shaming. Students in the near reduced category may not eat lunch at times in fear of being singled out in front of their peers, their friends, having the cool food on a tray from the a la carte line is a sign of status a cool kid has the cash. The a la carte line, even though it does offer some really nice variety, looks like food could be purchased at, food that could be purchased at a food court, at which some high schools, they actually are. Big food relies on name recognition for students to buy their products, and Big Ag knows kids love hamburgers, corn dogs, and french fries and will eat them every single day for lunch. Finally, after standing in line to get food and then standing in another line to determine the lunch account status, a student has about 10 minutes to eat. Students often consume consume rather what satisfies their cravings first and often have no time to finish the rest of their food. The cafeteria noise is often so loud, kids have to yell to talk to their friends. Very little supervision is in the lunchroom, puts everyone in a daily survival mode instead of ensuring students are getting a healthy meal. Michelle Obama's Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act brought more fresh fruit, vegetables, and whole grains to school meals and regulations to monitor sugar and salt consumption. Before the ink was fresh on signing the, law, the act, the actual act into law, the food industry was positioned to market new processed products to kids and promote new easy to serve fast food items to food service authorities incredible as it seems. Manufacturers were able to tweak products to meet the new nutritional standards. Before we knew it, Rice Krispie treats, Frosted Flakes, and Pop-Tarts were all made with just the right amount of whole grain. 
fast food and carnival like products make claims that eating pizza would make you smart and corn dogs would take you to the top of the class. Danon, or, uh, Domino's altered their recipe to include a whole grain crust and less cheese, but otherwise looks the same as home delivery. Except the pizza at home doesn't make a kid smart, right? If you are ready to walk away now, I understand, but I promise it will get better in the end. Over the last year or so, Trump's administration has been slashing away at the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. The USDA uses the word flexibility as a way to relax nutritional guidelines to help food service authorities make food more appealing to kids. Even though the new guidelines may have been a challenge in the beginning, the act actually increased healthy consumption by kids of fruits and vegetables and did not cause any additional food waste. The second round of USDA flexibilities is pending and would allow a decrease in fruit and vegetables. For instance, Vegetable flour found in pasta would be considered a serving of vegetables if the proposed flexibilities are confirmed. The USDA seems to be okay with kids not being able to identify a fruit or vegetable on their plate. Thank goodness advocates who have children's health as their agenda have the ability to fight back. Just last week, a judge overturned the rule on the first set of flexibilities because the USDA moved forward without sufficient public notice. Schools are big business and big food and big ad, ag are courting, they're actually courting food service authorities in order to stuff corporate park pockets rather while leaving children nutrient poor. How is the food industry allowed to get away with outrageous claims while selling products packed with salt and sugar? The National Potato Council lobbied hard when the second round of flexibilities was being considered. If the new flexibilities are confirmed, the members of the National Potato Council are going to win big because their potatoes, translation fried potato products, can replace a fruit at breakfast and also can replace a green leafy vegetable at lunch. Big food manufacturers contribute $10 million to the School Nutrition Association, which is an organization of food service directors and managers. Every year, school food authorities are wooed by food companies to sell their products with the promise of fast, easy, cheap, and safe. Many processed food manufacturers often offer awards and incentives to buy even more of their products. Even though the association shares the same concerns as health officials when it comes to hunger, they support the USDA flexibilities questioning where the SNA's interests lie. So cute kids, eating apples in school posters and a veggie filled lunch tray posted on the school website is not ex actually what ends up on a student plate. And I guess I have to know because one year I was assigned two lunch duties back to back and I calculated it was 16,000 hours of lunch duty in a given, that given year. I am able to give you a picture of how the complexity of school lunch plays out. And let's not underestimate the mind of a middle school student when not under the watchful eye of a parent knows how to work the system. The photo in the upper right hand corner of this slide shows an actual breakfast that was brought to my first period class this school year. This breakfast alone served up almost two days worth of the recommended daily allowance of sugar for a teenager. During each school day for the last three years, I have walked through an elementary 
elementary cafeteria where kindergartners are eating lunch. I am stunned by the number of very young children who are drinking chocolate or strawberry milk every day. During a typical middle school school lunch period, a student takes a reimbursable meal, throws away one or two of the least desirable items, most likely the corn and the baby carrots, then hops into the L cart line and gets an extra item such as another slice of pizza, a sweet treat, and another flavored drink. The result is a meal that was intended to be nutritious but actually in the end does not meet nutritional standards. Students end up with a lunch high in sugar, salt, and fat while creating unnecessary food waste and extra packaging from the extra snacks. Each day after that lunch duty, I question whether students were prepared to take on the rest of the school day. And how were they gonna reach their full potential? The district mission statement includes maximum learning for all students filled with questionable ingredients, nutrient deprived and perhaps still hungry, students are expected to learn and educators are ex expected to teach. The National School Lunch Program is a bit of a farce that either leaves children hungry or lacking in nutrition that is necessary for students to achieve academic success. School meals in many school districts across the nation put students at risk for food-related diseases and set the stage for poor academic performance. As a garden-based learning educator, along with being a regular classroom teacher and a parent of three kids, I struggle with the idea of what school food does to de-educate or uneducate students about real food. I am baffled by the irony of the National School Lunch Program competing with their own USDA Farm to School Program. The idea that students cannot identify a vegetable on their lunch tray because USDA flexibilities allows the veggie to be pizza sauce is counterproductive to teaching kids about good nutrition. Could Farm to School be a way to buffer the blatant disregard of the health of children in exchange for making food corporations and their CEOs richer? And where does the burden of an unhealthy school lunch fall? The burden falls on families who may not fill out an application for a free or reduced meal because it may affect something like their immigration status, or they fall into the near reduced lunch status. The burden also falls on teachers who are judged and evaluated based on their students' ability to succeed. Sadly, the National School Lunch Program aimed to feed children for over 70 years actually contributes to the problem of equity, inclusion, and justice in America. It cannot go Without saying, the USDA, USDA does its best to feed an incredible amount of hungry children. I hear reports after reports that school meals may be the only food children living in poverty receive. Food service personnel share stories of students shoving food in their mouths each Monday morning because they have had, not had anything to eat or much to eat over the weekend. This has been become more evident with COVID. In a time of crisis when good nutrition is, is even more important, satisfying hunger does come first. Now, I have to say, USDA has wonderful programs, wonderful grants. I really think there are incredible people working for the USDA. I just don't agree with the political arm and Sonny Perdue's agenda. Admittedly, this picture of FAIR is what I'm less familiar with, as I guess many of you are too. In the beginning, I blame food service managers for the unhealthy, for the unhealthy food that appeared on their lunch lines. I have discovered 
that all they want to do is make sure hungry kids eat the food. During my research, I have come to the conclusion that what many food service managers do is close to an, a miracle and if that few of us would be up for the task. From assessing free and reduced applications, procure your, procurement rather of compliant foods, food safety reporting, managing staff, prep, cooking and serving, to monitoring each reimbursable meal is, well, it's kind of like what a mom does every day. As a matter of fact, this is what keeps the profession and school lunch going. Lunch ladies in the labor of love. Many mothers work in school cafeterias because they work the same hours their children go to school. Unskilled workers usually cannot afford childcare if they have full-time jobs. Because our society, society does not value care work, pay is low because it is assumed women will do the work mostly because they love the children. But this type of care work keeps women below the poverty line. Juggling more than one part, more than one part-time job with little or no benefits. It is no surprise that minorities make up most of the food service workers. Because the pay is so low and the hours are spotty, it is extremely difficult to attract and retain workers to food service jobs. Jobs are filled with unskilled workers who have no culinary experience or training. Because there is limited funds for training and equipment, making food from scratch is nearly impossible. Cheap labor lends itself to cheap food that can be unpacked, heated up by a few workers, and served to hundreds of children in just a few hours each day. So finally, a happy slide. With all the sorrow the National School Lunch Program brings, there is much joy in seeing radical change when districts decide to value real food and real jobs to ensure children are fueled up, ready to learn, and stay healthy. A school district in South Carolina pre prepares made-from-scratch meals every day. My friend Joe Urban is one example of food a food service champion that ignores flexibility values collaboration and incorporate school gardens to support nutrition education. When students grow their own food, they are more likely to eat it. If the food children grow is on the lunch line, connections are being made and the education system works in unison without mixed messages. As Alice Waters says, school lunch is an academic subject. For a deep dive into school food on the front line, check out School Meals That Rock on social media. As we close in on how to make school lunch fair for all humans, there is a model that is currently in operation. Michelle Obama not only made way for healthier food consumption, food, I'm sorry, funds for training and equipment, but also made possible the community eligibility provision to feed children free in districts who have 40% of their students living in poverty. All students receive a free lunch whether their families can afford it or not. Still, the a la carte line exists for those who can afford it or want to skip the free meal where they can have plenty of fast food options. The model for FAIR is a universal free lunch, school lunch for all. All meals are the same, which means one line and less time in line. Every lunch would meet nutritional standards and are not subjected to flexibilities. Or in other words, a fruit is a fruit, not fruit juice, and a vegetable is a vegetable, not pizza sauce. This means the federal government would have to value real food to feed children so they grow up to be healthy and hunger free. What the federal government rarely promotes is that benefits such as SNAP actually stimulates the, the economy. It benefits, if benefits are given to poor families who do not have the same opportunities as you and I, they are able to purchase more than just food, such as rent and healthcare. 
when a free lunch is given to all students. We are investing in their health and diminishing health care costs now and when they are adults. We also begin to break the cycle of racism and inequality. I cannot imagine all that money that goes into bureaucracy of the National School Lunch Program. What if those funds could be directly assessed to feeding kids? If all of this is too much, and believe me, it is for me too, please only hear this. Educational institutions have the capacity to transform the food system. If we institute free school lunch for all, local farmers and producers would thrive, local economies would grow, and the environment would be regenerated with small farming and incredible amounts of less waste. 100,000 schools serve 29.8 million kids every school day. 100 thousand schools serve 29 point million kids every day and that is not all the children it could serve. I have not talked about how to approach and break down barriers for changing a broken system. If I or others had been successful I, then I guess I would not be having we would not be having this lecture. Even though school food has become better, many school districts resist change and don't have the courage or time to improve the food system within their school lunchrooms. This is a labor of love. Even though as a teacher, I shouldn't have to fight for my students to be well fed in order for them to perform well. The fight continues though with working with state legislators to sponsor bills and policy work through Slow Food USA. Teacher associations and food service unions are necessary opportunities where policy needs to be written to create lasting change. We have to face the fact that big food and big ag are not going away. We can become allies if we encourage and praise their efforts when they move towards a more sustainable system that pr produces minimally, minimally, can't say it, Processed foods. I'm trying to wrap up here. So where do we begin? My answer is by becoming an active member of the District Wellness Committee where students, parents, and grandparents and community members are encouraged to belong in order to have a voice. Again, thanks to Michelle Obama, the Wellness Committee must be comprised of a food service director, wellness coordinator, administrators, and nurses, along with others to promote collaboration in the interests of children. And today, this Earth Day, and in the time of COVID, when inequalities in the food system are hyper pronounced, this happens to be the last day to submit comments to the USDA about the proposed second round of USDA flexibilities. This is the first step to make your voices heard. Thank you for allowing me to tell my story. And thank you, Cynthia, for sharing that story. Have the ability now for everyone to be able to unmute themselves as you've got questions uh, feel free to raise your hand and we'll call on you um, i'm going to ask the speakers if you can um, unmute your microphones and turn your videos on so that way um, it should be easier to bounce around shane i'm going to ask you if you can unmute your mic and ask your question um, for some reason i cannot find my um, yeah my chat function here so go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's okay. That that works great. Hey, Kareem, thanks for your uh, your talk and thanks to all the speakers for your comments. Um, I my, the question I sent was, um, I, well, I work in Creek Sarco, um, and I was just curious. Um, we, you talked about some of the challenges that uh, farmers are facing, and I've observed some of those as well. And I was just curious what um, strategies farmers are using to try and adapt to um, shorter growing seasons um, in the areas where you work, Santa Cruz, Jalapé, Aguante. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's good to hear uh, uh, someone that knows about the era. Um, so there, there are different um, types of uh, corn. Uh, one that's called um, it's a, a, a short 
it, it grows in a, sh a shorter period of time, but not all the farmers have this corn. And so what they're doing is um, trying to share the seeds. And also if, uh, you know, if there is any other tips. So there are a lot of different things going on that I hadn't mentioned. So these villages are close to the Guatemalan border. And if you sort of familiar with that area, it's, there's a lot of, um, uh, pesticides and runoff so it comes mm -hmm. down the river um, sanitation on both sides of the border is not the best um, and what is happening is that um, the milpa when they clear the fields plant the corn they're seeing more grass weeds and so mm -hmm. that's also a problem so the grass weeds um, tend to grow up and then choke the corn and you know mm -hmm. again reduces yields and also the pollution from the runoff affects the yields and and things like that and what has happened is that um families on the guatemalan side of the border have really clear cut everything up to the belizean border and so if you look at a map you'll see like like deforestation on one side and green on the other side and so because these borders are porous, we're also seeing families coming over and um, clearing on the Belize side as well. So there's a lot of these little issues going on, but the, 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 the immediate qu uh, answer to that is there are, they have identified like uh, two different types of maize, one that can grow um, in a shorter season than the, than the long season one that they've been using. Um, we're still not sure how well it's doing yet. Um, the government of Belize um, has an um, agricultural um, center near the villages in the area that they're able to, you know, um, assess that. But again, particularly in uh, um, developed countries, uh, developing countries, you know, it takes some time. So we're not quite clear yet on, on how, that's, how that's progressing. Yeah, I know. I don't. I don't. I haven't investigated this a lot, but I know that um, there these issues were obviously going on in Quicasarco as well, and you know some farmers are trying to diversify in a lot of ways, um, uh, focusing on other kinds of things. Um, and if and if it's not too much, I I do have one quick follow up. And do you find people that trying to turn more to markets or become more integrated with markets as a way to deal with um, getting access to different kinds of foods or perhaps getting capital to sort of support um, different ventures? Yeah, it's very hard. So um, one thing that they're doing also in the area is like tourism. Um, mm. uh, there are sort of natural uh, topo topographical formations that, you know, um, waterfalls, that sort of thing. So there's some of that. Um, uh, and then I, I guess, so the government built a really nice road, but what that does, it's sort of a double-edged sword. What it does is brings in um, iterant business people that sell already prepared or processed food. And so that it's creating a very sort of convenient way to get food, but it's not culturally, it's not traditional food. And that's another issue. So the diversification would be, there's some um, people going into tourism in the area. Um, but I guess also it's just, people would go to Toledo, the, the, the town, and to try to look for work. Thanks, Green. Great, thank you, Shane, for your question. Um, I don't see any new questions. Um, if there are, again, please add that to the group chat. Um, so in the time remaining, and I'm just gonna keep an eye on our 715 um, timeline. Um, we've got a question for Cynthia and one for JP. So um, Cynthia, I'll start with you. Um, you know, you were mentioning today's the last day to make those public comments on um, the current policies that are happening. And I'm just um, curious, what's the a more immediate next step or next couple of steps um, for you and the work that you're doing? 
Oh gosh, it's it's continuous. Um, I think what we need to look at, um, you know, there's a couple great media outlets like Civil Civil Eats. I would follow to really, you know, keep up on this. If the first uh, set of flexibilities in question, I would assume now that the second set of uh, flexibilities um, are now going to be in question. If there was enough time for those to um, to respond. Um, well, what we have is a incredible response during COVID um, for school lunches that are feeding an amazing amount of hungry kids. And we have to praise the USDA for um, doing that. We have some really, unfortunately, there's so much to talk about, but Ohio has some really great things happening. There's a partnership with Panera Bread and the uh, Children's Hunger Alliance that are feeding kids, but I think it is calling attention to that not only do we need to feed kids, but when they get back into school, these kids who are hungry need to, because they get most of their nutrients at school, we need to make sure they get them at school. So I would say two things is just really stay tuned and follow what's going on with COVID and also follow what's going on with this next set of flexibilities. Um, and I can post on the Slow Food website um, after we're off here um, or in the chat uh, where you can comment because it is a little confusing. Um, so I, I will make sure that information is available. Awesome. Um, and then before I get to JP's question, uh, Mallory has a question for you. Um, so Mallory, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Okay, hi, Cynthia. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for your talk. I thought it was really interesting. Um, my question is kind of related to everything with COVID, um, which is that there's been a lot of like publicizing, at least I've seen on social media, of being like, look at these cool school districts who are doing all these cool things to get kids the lunches that they normally would. But I'm wondering about like, what is the actual access to those? Because I'm guessing a lot of the people whose kids were taking advantage of that can't you know maybe take the time or have the resources to drive their kid to the school or wherever to actually get that food or maybe not don't have the motivation to get it or whatever the case may be so i guess that there's kind of a differential access to those resources yeah, yeah. um it's interesting because i had a, a good conversation with children's hunger alliance and they're actually um going to sites where columbus city school um, students can't don't have quick access to or, or easy access to, I should say. So they're doing um, a fantastic job of supplementing those school lunches. Um, and I talked to also City, Columbus City Schools, who I have great relationship with as well with their school garden program. And they're fe feeding all children, whoever comes up and it's all word of mouth, basically, you know, oh, it's at this site, you know, text success, okay, we can pick up food, they're feeding feeding everyone. Um, what is really great about the Children's uh, Hunger Alliance this uh, week in partnership with Farm to School um, here in Ohio, they are sending seed packets of green beans seeds with their school lunches to 15,000 families in Central Ohio. So they're making that that connection somehow, even though they're getting processed, some processed food, you know, shelf stable food, they are getting that connection to real food. That's great, thank you. Excellent, thank you Mallory, for your question. Um, and then I guess JP, I'll just turn my, um, my last question over to you. Um, again, as we're trying to wrap up the series, um, I was hoping that you can share um, with those here and those who are gonna watch later, um, some of those places, um, Obviously, what you're about to endorse is your, your personal preference, but if there are any farmers markets or restaurants or places that you know of that are, um, in your opinion, slow food friendly or places that you frequent, um, just so people have an initial set of resources to, to think about going to. Oh, wow. There are so many places. Um, Worthington uh, Farmers Market, Clintonville Farmers Market in uh, uh, the... Uh, North Market, Farmer's Market, are, all have great um, vendors at them. Um, you know, I, I try to find as many places to buy food as is possible out there. I mean, uh, certainly uh, um, 
all these markets are the easiest easiest way to find these people, but you can also go to uh, places like uh, Dan the Baker and um, that will help me out, M.A., what's the butcher shop down in Grandview? Uh, butcher and Grocer? Yeah, Butcher and Grocer. I mean, uh, um, you know, it's it's just tr trying lots of different places is, I guess, the best best way I can say. And the flavor ends up winning out. Um, it's, it's uh, and, and honestly, it's the way you can, can eat the least expensively is uh, cooking yourself at home and um, finding out how you can buy things at less less expensive prices a lot of times. Excellent. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think it's one of those things where as we're talking about fair um, and the cost and the ability to do it, even if we take one of those slow food ingredients um, and really just celebrate that the best that we can, I think that's a, a good positive step in the direction that we're hoping um, everyone gets to. Um, well, with that said, it's, it is our time to, to bring this to a close. So I just want to thank again our speakers. Um, I've got on the screen, um, hopefully it's showing um, a link to the SurveyMonkey or the QR code, just bring your phone to that. Um, and take the, the really quick survey just so we can get a sense of what you thought about this event. Um, our next event uh, will be in the fall, um, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice. Uh, and we hope to bring a whole bunch of wonderful speakers to you. Um, thank you again to the Anthropology Public Outreach Program and the folks at Slow Food Columbus for helping us put this panel together. Um, so thank you everyone and have a wonderful evening.